Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this summer Friday morning. My name is Garrett Brooks with Slingshot Financial. Slingshot is a Colorado registered investment advisor, and we serve as an institutional representative for specialized investment managers, including Gator Capital Management. Um, excited this morning to have um, Derek Pilecki. Derek is the managing member um, at Gator Capital Management, the firm that he founded back in 2008. Um, he is the portfolio manager for Gator Long Short, which is the uh, flagship portfolio there, um, offered in a few different formats, including the original hedge fund, a mutual fund, as well as individual accounts. Um, Derek, joining us here, uh, fresh out of um, earnings season. So I'm sure uh, it's been a really busy time for you, but um, thanks for taking the time, Derek, um, and uh, glad to have you with us. Hey, good to be with you, Garrett. Yeah, absolutely. And so as, as we have done, this is you know our quarterly update, finding long and short opportunities in the financial sector. Derek is a financial specialist, has been for over 20 years. Um, like I said, Foreign founded Gator back in 2008. Before that was with Goldman Sachs Asset Management and a few other buy side firms before that, but always focused on the financial sector. So um, we are certainly, certainly glad to hear uh, what he has to say. Um, financials did a little bit better than expected coming out of earnings. And um, would love to hear, you know, your key takeaways from this year or this quarter's earnings season, Derek. Hey, Gary. And so this, I would say the, the story about this earnings season was a, like a relief rally in the banking sector. So regional banks, of course, had the bank crisis in March kicked off by Silicon Valley's failure. Um, and this, the regional bank index was down about 30% through um, mid-May. And as we got through... Um, the end of the second quarter and the bank started reporting second quarter earnings in, in mid-July, the, the bank stocks really rallied. And it I wouldn't say that the, the earnings reports were off the charts. I mean, they were, they were pretty ugly earnings reports. I mean, deposits were down, margin net interest margins were crimped, but things just were not as bad as what investors were expecting. And so there wasn't, there was, you know, some stability, I would say, for the most part, deposit costs went higher, but maybe not as high as some of the most bearish um, expectations. And we just, the, really the, the regional banking sector was too cheap coming into earnings season and investors bid it back up. And so um, there was a nice rally in, in the regional banking sector during during the earnings season. Yeah. Yeah, we saw we um, we saw that um, you know coming out the the um, regional banking ETF has, has um, actually been really kind of on a run here um, coming out of earnings. Um, well, to that end, um, what would you say overall is is the health of of the banks? You know, um, it seems like a distant memory now. The finance, the uh, banking crisis. Um, do you think this is something that's largely in the rear view for us, or? you know, something that, um, you know, could reemerge down the road, which, you know, was the fear, I think, at, at the time. Yeah. And so I don't think there'll be additional failures. I think there was one transaction where Bank of California agreed to acquire a merge with PacWest. And I think that that was done without any government assistance. And so I think that really signals the end of the crisis. I mean, that, you know, people were worried about PacWest. Um, they, they had lost a bunch of deposits during the crisis. And I think that's really a signal that, okay, now we're moving forward with, if banks get into trouble, there'll be um, deals done without government interference. I guess another takeaway from this earnings season was credit quality seems to be holding up just fine. That like everybody, the expectations were a recession's coming, credit's gonna get worse, just a matter of time, higher rates. And I think, you know, the, some of those things could still play out, like higher rates are definitely going to slow the economy, but I think it, it's pushed out a few quarters. And so investors are like, well, I don't have, to, I, there wasn't a necessarily a huge uptick in non-performing assets this quarter that people are expecting that those would turn into charge offs in Q3 and Q4. So I think, you know, just pushing out the, the risk of, of credit losses a few quarters is a big it is another bullish sign for regional banks. And then I, I would I would say that there's still a 
um, a wide variety of interest rate positioning amongst the banks. So there's a lot of banks with floating rate loans and pretty low cost transaction balance deposits. And then there's other banks that have a lot of fixed rate loans and are funded with very hot money or high cost deposits that, um, you know, those are kind of the two ends of the spectrum on interest rate positioning. And, you know, not all, not all banks are positioned the same. So, you know, to the extent that we have that, the long end of the yield curve go up and rates stay higher for longer, I think there could still be some banks that kind of stumble through the next couple of years. Yeah, it was, I'm, that's um, that's a great point because I'm I'm curious. I know when we spoke back in May, I, I was really surprised um, to hear you say that there's you know you're still finding some banks out there that haven't done much in the way of um, of of interest rate hedging, and I, I would have assumed at that point that you know everybody would have gotten you know gotten their ducks in a row and gotten that taken care of. Is is that something that you're still seeing? You still have you know some some banks out there that aren't necessarily um, hedged out properly that that's definitely the case you know it seems like they're just taking the view of um you know these residential low coupon residential mortgages that they own can't extend further in duration which may or may not be the case but it seems like short-term rates are gonna the fed's not gonna cut rates this fall so at least that's what chairman powell said last week um so i you know their cost of funds as they roll over are going to squeeze them. So, um, yeah, there's definitely banks that are exposed here uh, with a lot of low, low coupon mortgages on their books. Yeah, which is again a, a good um, uh, bodes well for you with the flexibility to both be both long and short. Um, you know, when you see those certain those situations pop up, you're able to seize those as well. Um, one of the other things I think that we were talking about um, back in May, and then I've heard you um, talk about a, a few times since that, um, leading up to this this past um, you know this past few weeks, we're looking for not only what the you know what the actual performance of particularly the banks would be, but also the market's response to that. And so you know thinking like are you know we get how to if we get some bad news and the and the market continues to push through um you know have we seen the lows and, and i'm wondering you know now with having seen some of this play out and the market's response what are you what are you thinking looking forward yeah in the absence of new information or new new crisis points i think the the mid-may lows and the regional bank index are the lows for the cycle i think that um you know unless there's a big turn in credit quality or the economy drastically slows from a, some exogenous event that we've seen the lows. Definitely. Yeah, that's that is that's good to hear. Um, <laughs> um, the other the other thing um, that I was curious about because you you had mentioned it a few times um, leading up to this as well was you know keeping a close look on. Uh, on loan volumes within the banks and, you know, keeping an eye for, do we see a tightening credit that could possibly, you know, um, exacerbate any type of economic downturn that we see? And I'm curious, you know, most recently, what are the, what are the banks seeing in terms of, um, you know, in terms of credit and, and loan volumes? Yeah, you're right. So, you know, I was worried after the, the regional bank crisis started, that we'd see a credit crunch where the banks would just be so worried about their own liquidity that they'd stop making loans and that would slow the economy. I guess we've gotten some new data points on that front that kind of evolved my thinking a little bit. First, um, it seems like that has happened to some extent that um, loan growth has slowed considerably from last year, but it's not clear that it's all supply side, meaning that it's not all the banks restricting making new loans. Some of it is demand side. So like to the extent that rates are, you know, the prime rates, eight and a half percent, borrowers just don't want to borrow money, eight and a half percent. And so um, you're not seeing as much loan demand. So loan growth slowed, but it's not all the banks restricting supply. It's some loan demand constraints. And then we have seen, um, you know, not every bank has been deposit constrained. Like there have been bank bankers who've been well positioned for this cycle and they're able to continue lending money. And so it's not like the whole industry is just cut off the spigot, not making loans. There are banks that are making loans that spread. They're asking for 
better terms on the loans, which is natural in a cycle. Like uh, they want wider spreads and better terms, and they might ask for the personal guarantee more insistently this time around. But um, you know, there are banks still making loans, and then we've also have the 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 private credit funds out there that are chomping at the bit to take to disintermediate the banks, and so they want to make loans that the banks are you know good loans that the banks are constrained from making. And so you know, it doesn't look like we're going to have the worst case scenario where credit crunch causes economic recession. We are having a slowdown, a natural slowdown because of loan demands down and the banks are fixing their balance sheets. But it seems like the banks are pretty much through most of the um, right sizing on liquidity and deposits. Um, so they're they're still making loans to the extent that borrowers want them. They're asking for higher spreads and better terms. And then you also, um, you know, if the banks are get are kind of held in check by these private credit funds being willing to provide credit at the right price. And so I, I don't see the scenario where we get a bank credit induced recession, which is good news for all of us. Yeah. You know, when you think through the recessions that we've had in the last 35 years. You know, 1991 and 2008 were really bank credit recessions that were pretty deep recessions. Whereas, you know, the recession from 01, 02 is more like, um, you know, capital markets, internet bubble, um, isolated recession. It wasn't a economy wide where Main Street wasn't getting funding. You know, the Main Street economy got funded through 01, 02, whereas 90, 91 or 0809 Main Street had trouble getting funding. So it doesn't look like we're going to have one of those deep recession scenarios. Yeah. So has the um the Fed have they nailed the um the soft landing, so to speak? Yeah, we'll see. Like I mean, there's a lag effect to higher rates. And so we haven't gotten full the full lag effect, but um it seems like the economy is pretty strong still in spite of it. So um in spite of all the rate increases. We'll, we'll see what the next six to 12 months bring. And, you know, there's isolated pockets that are really, really struggling, right? I mean, the office sector is tough. Like there's there's not going to be new offices built, um, that construction new offices. You know, those construction crews are going to have to to go to other property types. And, um, you know, there's going to be some, there's going to be a lot of office buildings that are going to be um owned by the, the bond holders or the mortgage holders instead of the equity holders. And so that will go through a cycle. Um, but, you know, there's other than that, there's not really an obvious thing that's going to contract in, in the economy right now. Maybe the venture capital field is there's not as much cap, venture capital funding, but, you know, really that's not a big, a huge, huge part of the economy. Yeah, that's that's great news. You know, I, I asked the question almost a little tongue in cheek because I, I think sometimes when things start to take on, you know, the grand narrative of the soft landing that it's almost, you know, we, we lose sight of the um, the real data points coming in and, and more, you know, focus on the story. And so everything you're saying certainly um, certainly is encouraging. And, you know, this is, you know, real actual data that we can point to and give you know, an indicator of, of what the economy is doing and, you know, seems, seems like things are working out. So let's hope that we stay on that path. Um, one other uh, quick question for you, because it, you know, is so timely. What are your thoughts on the um, Fitch downgrading U.S., uh, you know, the U.S. credit rating? Yeah, I mean, I, I am in the Jamie Dimon camp of the U.S. is, you know, the, the strongest superpower in the world, like, we're not going to default, I, I would say, um, you know, we're running pretty big deficits, the demographics have gotten marginally worse with um, the lack of immigration over the last few years. And so, you know, we have a lot of baby boomers retiring and Medicare costs are going to go up and social security costs. So I would say that, you know, the finances that are driving that downgrade are, are worse at the margin, but I, I still think we're AAA or the country's a AAA credit. Um, I do think that um, it doesn't take into account, you know, the ability the, to print money and, you know, inflate our way out of our debts. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's a lot of, it's a lot of noise and, you know, you, you shouldn't change your investment perspective because of that. Yeah. 
I'm glad you mentioned Dave, Jamie Dimon. I, I absolutely love it. I love that he says it doesn't matter while he's on his, you know, his bus tour through the U.S. It was very like, you know, <laughs> USA, USA. <laughs> 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 there's a lot i mean he's right about that i mean he's a, a big fan and he's right on a lot of those points and you know a lot of times we just get so focused on the pessimism and what's going to happen bad from here and he's pretty good about saying you know making us feel good about all the good stuff that's going on like the economy is pretty strong you know we all are living you know most most everyone's living better lives than they, they were 30 years ago so he, he's right about a lot to be optimistic on a lot of those things and he's in a good position to see it too right i mean he's he runs the best bank in the country the biggest bank in the country so he sees a lot of the good good stuff that's going on yeah yeah absolutely um so kind of shifting gears a little bit here from you know from the sector itself it's i have to point out you know your performance has been has been stellar um year to date i mean looking at uh easiest i guess to point to is mutual fund performance i mean you are uh you're hanging right in there with the with the broad market um impressive considering you know we have big tech based a few big tech names driving that rally um and the financials been somewhat of a laggard um to that end you're absolutely clobbering the um the uh long only financials index um year to date and then you know, looking on longer time periods as well. And so I'm curious with that, you know, with that in mind, where do you, where are you seeing opportunities now? Um, you know, how are you positioning yourself, you know, going forward? Yeah. So, I mean, I think within financials, it's going back to our discussion earlier about interest rate positioning. So I think to the extent that I'm finding banks that are still benefiting from higher rates and, um, and then I'm shorting against them, the banks that have a lot of fixed rate lo loans on their books um, and and weaker deposit franchises. So to pull out two examples, you know, there's a bank in suburban Chicago called Old Second Bank Corp. And it's, you know, it's in the far west Chicago suburbs. And a couple of years ago, they bought a bank called um, West Suburban, which is kind of sitting between downtown and Old Second's branch network. And West Suburban was a, um, a, a franchise that had a lot of property locations that this previous CEO had bought in the 50s and 60s. And these are just in good neighborhoods, you know, middle class neighborhoods where people use the branches for transactional banking. It, they weren't rich people. They were just kind of like middle class people who had checking accounts and had a few thousand dollars in their checking accounts and weren't great, aren't great sensitive. And so it was a great acquisition by Old Second. And so they've also kept their most of their balance sheet and floating rate loans. And so during this rate cycle, they haven't had to pay out for deposits. You know, they've raised their rates a little bit, but um, really they've benefited from the, the repricing of the loan book. And so their net interest margins expanded and, you know, their ROE is above 20% now. And so I think, you know, price to book value is like, it's, it's rallied recently, but, you know, it's still under two times book. And uh, I think that's a pretty interesting uh position from the long side. And you contrast it to a bank like Hingham Institute for Savings, which is on the South Shore in Boston. You know, this is a traditional thrift. They make a lot of apartment loans. They have a very fixed rate loan book heavy um, balance sheet. And it's funded with um, a lot of high cost deposits. You know, there's a lot of CD funding. Their loan to deposit ratio is well above 100%. Usually, a, a commercial bank will run with an 85 or 90% loan to deposit ratio, but you know Hingham has a, a huge, huge loan to deposit ratio. So that means they have to fund a, a good portion of their balance sheet with wholesale borrowings, and so their interest rate spread has just collapsed during this rate cycle. And so, um, you know, it's getting to the point where if, if you know, I don't think the Fed's going to keep raising rates, they might raise one more time, maybe they're done. But if they were to raise rates again, or two more times, you know, Hingham's close to earning negative spread on on their on their balance sheet. So and this, this stock still trades well above book value. So it's, it trades for like 1.25 times book value. And so I just think, you know, given that they're going to earn subpar ROE for the foreseeable future, this should trade below book value. And so they just those are the opportunities there. I think the opportunities persist in banks because a lot of people are expressing the view of banks through the ETFs. You know, there's a lot of banks out there and they are 
you know, collectively, there's a lot of banks and a lot of market cap, but each individual bank's relatively small. So it's hard to get positions and people use the KRE, big investors use the KRE to, to express their view on banks, but the KRE buys or sells the entire system or, you know, across all banks where they're not selecting individual banks of, oh, I want to buy these 10 banks that have um, that are asset sensitive. And I want to short these banks that are liability sensitive. Like it's, you know, you just buy them all or short them all. And so, um, you know, I think there's nice opportunity for people like me who does the, do the work on the individual banks and say, okay, this bank's well positioned for this rate scenario and this bank's not. And, um, you know, so that's where I'm seeing the opportunities going forward. I think there's still upside to the banking sector. I think valuations are still cheap, but, you know, I also like the opportunities within differentiating between the banks within the sector. And that's one of the benefits of having the flexibility of the long short fund. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great point to that end. Um, you know, a lot of the people that we work with are, are even broader, more, um, you know, asset allocation uh, oriented. And so, you know, you take, you know, the, um, the, the very selective nature, your ability to be both long and short, and then you combine that with a, a much broader diversified portfolio, and you have a really, really interesting and nice differentiated return stream in the portfolio. Um, and I know that, you know, current clients have, have really enjoyed that, um, you know, going back to, to uh, my point earlier in terms of, you know, a few, when you look at the broad market, um, you know, just a few concentrated names kind of pushing that when you're able to maintain the same type of returns, but, you know, they're, they're much less correlation. Um, it's, it's a really nice fit for, um, for an overall diversified portfolio. Yes. yes. Definitely. That's uh, that is great news. Um, how about outside of banks? Um, what you know? What are you generally seeing, or what what are your thoughts? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the I think the investors are recalibrating to um, a deferred recession. So, like we we're really thinking about um, you know with inflation coming down and the Fed potentially being at the end of its rate height cycle. It, but maintaining rates at this level for a while, what does that mean for companies and and um, and the market? And see, you know, generally it's been pretty pretty bullish for um, some of the higher beta names. And so to the extent that the pre people are deferring the pricing in the recession, that that's helped help the sector. Um, so I I think some of the interesting names in the sector, you know, there's some asset managers that are trading for low valuations. Um, you know, there's a there's an ongoing uh, fair thesis in asset managers that we have the shift from active management to passive management. And so the ETFs are taking share. And so the active managers have had negative flows and the stock prices have gotten very inexpensive. And so there's some active managers that have neutral to positive flows that are trading for five or six times EBITDA. And so I think that's an interesting play there. And then there's some specialty finance, specialty insurance companies that are um, interesting. Like, so the, the mortgage insurers have, have been doing well. We own um, Genworth, which owns a mortgage insurer called Inact. And so that's been, been a, a good area. I mean, mortgage insurance is doing great because the housing market's staying strong here, even in the spot in in spite of higher interest rates, people just aren't for sellers of their homes. Like they're able to make the payments. They have three percent mortgages. They're not, you know, volumes are way down. If somebody does have to default on a a home, mortgage insurers aren't taking losses now because you know all the business they wrote in 2020 and 2021 that there's embedded gains there. So mortgage insurance is an, another good area. So um, those are you know between asset managers and Especially insurance; those are the other areas that we we like in the portfolio. Oh, that's that's um, great spots to be. It makes a lot of sense. Um, one other question that I that I had for you, um, I was actually talking with a, with a um, investment officer at at a wealth management firm, and um, you know he we within the context of of Gator and um, you know a few other types of um, specialty funds. 
he was curious. He, he views the world very much within, um, you know, the kind of smart beta, the factor um, type of analysis and, and uses that in constructing portfolios. Now, I have heard you um, in the past talk a little bit about your views on how you incorporate and think about factors um, in managing your fund, but I, I thought it would be I thought it would be helpful for people on the call here today and anyone who joins, um, you know, later on um, to to hear what you know what your thoughts are on factors and constructing the portfolio around factors. Yeah, so I mean, I guess we. I look at factors um, to make sure that we're not taking the same bet on both sides of the portfolio. So like, you know, and this goes back to a learning from 2014 of, you know, I had the view that banks were cheap and REITs were expensive. And so I was long a lot of banks and short a lot of REITs. And then the embedded factor risk there was if rates went up, both sides of the portfolio worked or if rates didn't go up, they, they, both it was both it was an interest rate bet on both sides of the portfolio. So like banks benefit from higher rates, rates get hurt by higher rates. And so in 2014, rates didn't go up. And so the banks kind of muddled along and the the REITs did great. And so I had the same bet on both sides of the portfolio. So we pay attention to you know the the different risk, the different factor models. Um, you know, we use Bloomberg, we load the portfolio into Bloomberg, look at what the the factors our portfolio is expressing and make sure that we're not out of bounds on having the same factor bet on, on both sides of the portfolio. My factor friends will be excited to hear that. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I think that, um, that those are all the questions that I had immediately. I'm going to go ahead and um, um, open up here for Q and A. So anybody on the call that would like to uh, ask a question, go ahead and pop that into the chat, um, and I will answer them as they come in. Well, Derek will answer them. I will address them, and Derek will answer them as they come in. Give it just a second. Feel free to answer them, Garrett. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like just one in the queue here, and this is a, this is a slam dunk for you. Um, what um, what is the net long um, positioning of the portfolio? So I guess you know what is what is long yep. versus short positioning? Yep. So right now the portfolio is ninety percent gross long, and it's forty percent gross short. So the net's plus fifty. That's a pretty comfortable spot for us. Um, you know, usually the net's somewhere between 30 and, and 75 or 80. And so 50 is kind of like middle of the fairway. Uh, part of that reflects, you know, we've had a nice run up in July. So a couple of our, our positions hit their price targets and we 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 reduced. And so that that kind of, you know, we don't necessarily take the, the net and say, okay, we have to be at one point or another. It, it, really flows from names we're finding and you know we're we're still finding a lot more longs than we are shorts and and so we're we're comfortable at plus 50. Yeah we always get that question so thanks for asking and uh looks like that's it it's a quiet bunch I wonder um wonder if people are, are are taking the call from the beach lakeside you know whatever it might be here today hopefully hopefully everybody's enjoying their summer um, I know you're you're now um sharing your time between Tampa and New York City um, which which is of interest um I know to you know some of the the people I'm sure who are on the call here and um yeah so I mean I, I rent an apartment in New York in March and you know couple of drivers to that, a um, little bit more corporate access. So, you know, it seems like every financials conference is in New York and, you know, there's a lot more companies coming through New York on a regular basis. So just meeting with more management teams while I'm up there and, you know, and then there's a little bit of, uh, there's, you know, getting access to more investors. And so like we're meeting with more prospective investors by being, spending more time in New York. And so th those are the two benefits. And, um, you know, I'm coming um, you know, our families were rapidly approaching empty nest stage. So, you know, my wife and I have spent 20 years in Florida and, um, you know, we're just kind of looking for the next adventure. And so we're starting to spend a little bit of time in New York. 
and getting some business benefits out of it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I know you're also um, you're also off on a, a huge uh, golf trip um, coming up here. Yeah, next week I'm going to Scotland for a few days with some buddies. So I've never been over there, and you know I'm a big golfer and just love the game. And so just we're going to the eastern part of Scotland around St Andrews, Murfield, and uh, playing. You know, I told the tour operator I don't want to play any modern courses over there. I want to play all the old old Scottish courses. So. Um, so looking forward to that and getting a few rounds in. So, yeah, enjoy. I, I am uh, not really much of a golfer myself, uh, but I know certainly a lot of people in the business are. And so is it, it I don't want to speak for you, but is it, is it fair to say you're up for a round? Um, anybody in the, you know, in the New York area or certainly Tampa area, you want to get out on the, um, on the course? Yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to play. So if, um, you know, if somebody comes, this fall or winter, if somebody's down in Florida and want to play, you know, please send me an email or give me a call or get in touch with me through Garrett and, you know, we'll get out in the links. That sounds great. Well, we're, uh, we're right up on time here. Appreciate it, uh, Derek. Um, any, any final words from you? You know, yeah, I think super interesting year as far as what's been happening with the banks. And so we're kind of in recovery mode here. Worst case scenario is not happening in regional banks. I think, um, you know, markets had a pretty good run. Financials have lagged. I think, you know, there's some catch up left within the financial sector. Um, still some catch up left in the banks. And um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the economy is looking pretty good here. So, you know, I think I'm pretty constructive. I, you know, we don't have to chase the high valuation stocks, you know, within the financial sector, there's a lot of cheap stocks still, reasonable valuations. And I think there's, you know, pretty good fairway in front of us. That's great to hear. Like you said, um, like you said, uh, when we spoke earlier this year with the, the banking crisis, kind of all eyes right there in your, in your sector. I mean, um, you know, if, if the economy, if the market keeps tossing you those fat pitches, I know you're just going to keep smacking them right out of the park. So, you know, keep it up. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Okay. Great. Thanks, Derek. And thank you, everybody. Um, obviously, any follow-up questions or requests for information, um, you can go ahead and pop that into the chat now. Um, as always, feel free to reach out directly to me and we'll make sure to get all of your questions and requests addressed. But um, with that, I hope everybody has a great afternoon, a great weekend, and uh, enjoys the rest of this summer. Thank you.